Thanks very much, uh, Alice. Um, it's a great honor to be here as a graduate of RCSI. Uh, the last time I was in this lecture theater, I was in your position. And I have to say the uh, hair went up on the back of my neck there as I walked in. I'm sure I was in various different contexts, lectures, exams, and all the rest. So it is a real great honor to be here. Uh, I do want to say to Dara, if he's still here, that I want to put my hat in the ring for that interview process out in Australia as well if you need any assistance. So I'm happy to carry your bags. <laughs> oh, oh, good, good, good. Well, I learned. So um, uh, my background, uh, as you heard, I, I went to the States actually um, quite a bit later. Uh, so I didn't start in the residency uh, route initially and uh, went over for fellowship training. So I went after my uh, registrar training in radiology uh, and went and did fellowship training in interventional radiology and in cardiovascular MRI. So I can speak uh, very confidently to the process at that point, but I'm obviously going to talk a lot about the residency programs in the US. Uh, just to echo uh, Dara's point, um, the, the training you receive in Ireland is, uh, is highly recognized abroad, particularly in the United States, and I'm sure the same goes for other parts of the world. Um, you, uh, it, it's well recognized that Irish graduates who come over are very competent clinically, um, very well trained, uh, very well qualified. And uh, certainly completing the higher level training in Ireland uh, stands a lot to a lot of the uh, graduates who, who come over. So um, I think uh, you're very privileged and very lucky uh, to be in an institution like the Royal College of Surgeons. It has a tremendous reputation abroad. And of all the institutions, I think, in Ireland, it is the one singular institution that actually has that type of international notoriety. When you mention that you're in the Royal College, people immediately know where you're from. So, uh, with that, uh, I, I think you should be very proud and feel very confident uh, whatever area of the world you consider going to. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the US. Um, I do not press, profess to be an expert on all the residency programs. Um, we can talk about some of the nuances later in the breakout sessions. Um, but as you know, uh, the US offers a wide variety of training opportunities at uh, residency and fellowship levels. Uh, the programs continue to expand, continue to become more specialized. Uh, the standards can vary depending on the institution uh, that you go to, the, the level of training, the difficulty in getting in uh, into the various institutions. However, the competition for the top tier institution still remains fairly intense. And when I talk about top tier, most people um, will, um, I guess, rate the, the various institutions based on the US, uh, news and, uh, world and new, uh, US uh, news report ranking system, which ranks the top 20 medical schools. So if you're going there, uh, most people who are going abroad to the US are probably going to look at those uh, medical schools. So you need to look at those rankings. Um, however, it does remain very, very competitive. The one thing I will say about this, the, the US is uh, it has a very uh, rigorous um, application system, uh, which can be quite daunting. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, some advice that I got when I was going over there is uh, do not be discouraged. Uh, those who hang in will be rewarded. Uh, and when I, when I talk about paperwork, I'm talking about things like visas, license applications. It's in, uh, incredibly frustrating. Um, but you need, do need to do it. Uh, there are no uh, shortcuts. Uh, you do have to fill it in, and those that hang in and, and do it completely uh, will be successful in getting into uh, the various programs. So the structure of training is broadly similar um, uh, to what we see in Ireland. Uh, there is an intern year. Uh, residency varies depending on the specialty, and then this is usually followed by fellowship. And after that, uh, you either enter a faculty position or many uh, graduates may go into private practice. Now, the, the residency programs themselves um, um, are, can be subcategorized into uh, categorical residencies. These are residencies that are categorical for a specialty. So, for example, radiology is a categorical uh, residency. Um, plastic surgery is a categorical residency, which means that when you enter it, you're, you're going to complete your entire training right to the end. And many of these categorical uh, residencies include an intern year. And unfortunately, in the US, uh, and this is, these rules are laid down by the ACGME, which is the American College, uh, our accreditation college of graduate medical education, it is a requirement to do the, U, uh, the intern year in the US. So you will do your intern year here, many of you, to complete your training in medical school. You will uh, likely have to uh, repeat the intern year 
The only exception, uh, exceptional residency is uh, pathology. It does not require a clinical intern year. All the others do. And many of them will be uh, part of the categorical residencies. Now, um, it's important, though, to inquire before you uh, apply for residency if some programs will give you credit for your intern year in Ireland. Many places will give you a few months credit. And while that may not seem like a lot, it actually is good because it allows you an opportunity to take about two or three months out and do research during your intern year. So, uh, it, but that varies really depending on the specialty and, and, and varies depending on the, uh, on the institution as well. So I'm just going to outline in the talk, and I'll try and get through these quickly. I'll talk briefly about the USMLE. I'm going to talk mostly about residency programs. I will talk about fellowship programs, and I have direct experience in that, and then finish up by talking about visas, licensure, and board certification. Um, these are important topics because uh, your decisions about residency will impact your ability uh, to become board certified, which is your ultimate aim, uh, which allows you to pract uh, practice uh, long term in the US. So first of all, um, the USMLE. Um, you probably all know more about this than I do. Uh, can I ask how many people here have sat the USMLE or intend to sit the USMLE just by a show of hands? Okay. That's great. Uh, so most people, uh, when I was in RCSI, most of us did the USMLE as well. It, it was uh, called the Fem Gems at that point. Uh, I think it was the Foreign Medical Graduate Exam. I'm sure many of you guys probably did it as well. Unfortunately for me and for others who went, they disbanded the Fem Gems. So I actually had to redo the USMLEs when I went to the States, which was incredibly uh, difficult. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I can somehow sympathize with you, although you are in a much better place to do these exams when you're in medical school, as you well know, particularly the part one. So you know about steps one and two. They're, they can be taken by medical students enrolled in medical school. Step three are gen is generally taken by people who have already obtained their medical degree and passed steps one and two. And the ECFMG certificate, is what, which is what you're looking for, can be awarded after steps one and two are completed. Uh, and they have to be completed within seven years. And this, these rules are on the website. Uh, you're very familiar with this, probably. The ECFMG certificate, though, is important because, as you know, first of all, it takes a bit of time to get it. And the ECFMG certificate uh, serves for you as an international medical graduate to the US. It serves as your dean's letter. So in the US, the US graduates, everything is dependent on the dean's letter, which is a summary, essentially, of your medical school training. For foreign medical graduates or international medical graduates, uh, it is the ECFMG certificate. So you absolutely have to have that by the time you apply. And the application material for residency has to be in generally in the first week in September. But nothing will start until the certificate is in or for US graduates until the, the dean's letter is in. So you will not be contacted by institutions for interview until that material is in. So that is critically the most important part. The step one score is critical for getting into competitive residencies. Now, this, of course, is discouraging because this is actually the most difficult step. Uh, I recall that I, uh, I was at the fellowship level, so I did uh, modestly OK on the step one. Uh, unfortunately, if you're trying to get into residency, you need to score high, particularly for the competitive programs and the competitive institutions. Uh, many programs use this as their main discriminator for shortlisting. Um, so, for example, I can speak for radiology. Um, you know, there's probably uh, a thousand applicants to Northwestern where I'm based. A um, hundred people um, uh, will be shortlisted for interview, and most of this is based on the USMLE score, with a cutoff typically of around 230, uh, or two, in around 230 for uh, competitive residencies. Uh, steps one, two, and three are also generally required for obtaining an H-1B visa, and I'll talk a little bit later about that. This is the visa you actually do want to try and come on. The, obviously, this is not going to affect U.S. graduates here, or, or rather um, U.S. nationals, but for everyone else, you do require a visa. Most programs do, however, want to give you a J-1, but ideally you would like to have a, an H-1B visa, but the new rules are that you are, are really required to have all three steps. And as I mentioned, uh, the process can be arduous and, and frustrating. So it's important to stick to it in order to get into the residency program. Um, application to residency in the U US is coordinated through the National Resident Matching Program. And I put the various websites uh, down there. There's a lot of information uh, available through these various websites. So this is the, the match that people talk about. 
Uh, all your application material is submitted through what they call the ERAS or the Electronic uh, Residency Application Service. So this will be your application uh, form itself which is filled out, uh, your personal statement and you know uh, everything done through the US incorporates a personal statement. If you find that difficult to write, Google personal statements for residency applications and there are lots of examples. I, I saw one set website where guys were actually just guiding you through how to write this thing. Uh, I'm not sure how many people actually read the personal statement but you know obviously if you did some a uh, fantastic voluntary service uh, in your time or have some nice story to tell, this is where you can do it. Um, but also uh, the letters of reference, so your reference letters and of course the Dean's letters for the US graduates and the ECFMG certificate have to be uploaded through that as well. Some material from the NMR, NRMP website which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, if you look over here, these are the percentage of um, US graduates uh, that apply to the match and they get matched through the residency, various residency programs. Over here, however, are the international medical graduates. And I was uh, uh, actually um, surprised that there were so many. It's actually a very large uh, percentage of the overall applicants to the US are international medical graduates and quite a high proportion match in various residency programs. And again, that was an education to me. I always considered that international graduates were at somewhat of a disadvantage. They're, they are at a disadvantage. Uh, however, it's not a significant disadvantage. And there are no rules in the US to say that you have to accept uh, you know, a US graduate over an international graduate. There are some broad ACGME guidelines on this. Um, but you, uh, you stand a very good chance and are very competitive which are US counterparts. So let, let that be a, a word of encouragement to you. These are all the programs uh, and this is also material uh, that, that is available on this website and it will give you, this gives you a sense of how competitive these programs are. So numbers of applicants per, per position, uh, you know, 1.8 here is a very competitive program. Plastic surgery is the most competitive residency program in the US. Any budding plastic surgeons here? Who here wants to do plastic surgery? And one guy in this? Okay. So um, you need to, uh, you know, really have a very competitive application for this. It's very difficult for US graduates to get into this. The other competitive programs are uh, radiation oncology, uh, orthopedic surgery here, and otolaryngology or ENT. They're the four top uh, most competitive residency programs. Uh, the less competitive programs, not meaning they're lesser, but less competitive, are uh, family medicine, so GP, uh, internal medicine, and uh, pediatrics, uh, tend to be a little bit less competitive to get into. So therefore, you've got a better chance as an international graduate going in, getting into those also with a lower board score. Okay? So that's important. And, and this material, I believe, is available to you. But it goes through uh, the numbers of U.S graduates that match and don't match and the number of independent or really international graduates that match and don't match. These are the match rates then uh, divided by specialty and divided into US applicants versus the independent applicants. And again, you can see uh, the unmatched spots here, you know, the competitive residencies again, ENT, we've got orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, uh, neurological surgery or neurosurgery is also very competitive. General, general surgery traditionally was very competitive uh, in the US. It's opened up a bit in recent years, so it's a bit easier to get into general surgery. Most of the specialty uh, areas do require uh, a residency in general surgery unless it's categorical for that particular specialty, uh, such as neurosurgery or urology. And uh, then over here we have uh, diagnostic radiology, dermatology, and anesthesiology. So it varies. Uh, I guess the point of this is that the, the ease at which you can match into programs varies on the specialty. And traditionally in the US, um, uh, you know, the, the subspecialties like vascular surgery, cardiology, all of these tend to be more attractive for people to go into, and there, go into. And there are numerous reasons for this. They're maybe more technological, you know, it's reflected by their remuneration rates uh, in the longer term. Uh, things are changing a little bit in the US though as, as you probably know with this new healthcare act that's come out there's going to be an increasing focus, uh, that's if it makes it through the Supreme Court, but there's going to be an increasing focus on areas like uh, family medicine. So GP, there's 
the GP is generally considered underserved or underfilled within the US. So over the next five to 10 years, you're gonna find more people are gonna be going into that and the opportunities are gonna become much greater. So keep that in mind for people who are interested in doing that, uh, following that pathway. These are the statistics then also for uh, the various uh, 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 points that are looked at in the application. So I'll draw your attention to the step one and the step two score, but I, as I mentioned, the step one score is one of the biggest discriminators. So for US applicants, successful applicants is about 225 to 230, a bit lower uh, for independent applicants. This just shows you what the, the, the scores were for the independent or international applicants. However, in order to be, remain competitive, you really have to be competitive with your US counterpart. So um, try to do well in the US uh, MLE steps if you can. Uh, other things that are taken into account are the number of research experiences, number of abstracts, presentations, and publications. Work experience relates to clinical rotations, electives, things like that, electives in US hospitals if you can do that. Percentage of, who are AOA members. AOA members are the honors roll list uh, in the US. These are generally people who graduate at the top 10% of their medical school class. I don't believe we have a ranking here for that. It's, oh, there is, okay. So that's actually very helpful uh, to put in, into an application, because that is something that is, um, is used uh, when, when the applications are being reviewed. And then, not to dwell on this too much, but again, just, uh, this material you have just showing the various scores across uh, the specialties. Again, the, the, um, the competitive specialties such as ENT, orthopedic surgery, tend to have high USMLE board scores. Uh, dermatology is obviously popular, diagnostic radiology as well. And then the less competitive ones that I mentioned, family medicine, internal medicine, tend to have slightly lower average board scores. Uh, for um, uh, on the app when, when uh, grad or people match into the program. So, so to summarize the, the residency, how do you therefore then choose a residency? Well, first of all, obviously you've got to decide what specialty you want to go into. And this may, you may have a burning desire to be a vascular surgeon. I would recommend if you want to be a vascular surgeon, that's what you should do. That would be your first advice that you receive from anyone here. You should follow the specialty uh, that is going to give you the most satisfaction and uh, one that was going to give you the greatest rewards through your career. However, other factors may uh, enter into this, such as how competitive these programs are, how available they are, what the job scene is like in these in the longer term. The type of institution may affect it, so academic or community-based. There are residency programs that are community-based. Um, you know, so if I look at Chicago, you know, the big residency programs there are going to be in Northwestern or the University of Chicago, but you've got smaller institutions such as Rush, Loyola, UIC, that also offer uh, less competitive programs and, and are maybe a bit easier to get into. Um, but most people are going to be looking at an academic institution. What is your connectivity to these particular institutions? So do you have a link? Uh, Dara mentioned, um, you know, were there, are there some people who have been to these programs, or, you know, that are working here in Ireland now? Do you have some predecessors who are in a fellowship program, a residency program? Uh, these, this link, this network is, is, is really very advantageous for Irish graduates. Irish graduates have tended to end up in all parts of the world, and you can really use this network quite effective. Uh, I have had, I think, five or six fellows over the last several years in our fellowship program, uh, I, which I direct actually in Northwestern. And uh, you know, I will freely admit here, I wouldn't do this if I was in the US, but I will freely admit that I am partly biased because these are surgeons graduates, you know? And you know, I'm in a position where I can do that. You'll have other uh, graduates from Ireland who will also be in similar positions. So this is important to really explore these networks. And it, they'll also give you an idea about how good an institution is. Location, this may be important for some people, it was for me. You know, you may want to be in a big city versus not in a big city. Um, you know, do you want to go and work in, you know, the, the central Midwest, Wyoming, whatever, nothing against anyone here from Wyoming, but there might be some, more, uh, uh, s some smaller places that uh, you may not want to go, go to. Uh, what are the family implications? Uh, you know, there may be a husband and wife application. Uh, both of you are physicians. Well, there is an opportunity to do couples matching. Now, couples matching means you're maybe a little bit more difficult, but uh, it's an easy process. You just, you, you just apply online and state that you do want a couples match. And then finally, I'll mention a bit about the type of visa that's offered by the institutions. 
These are the principal determinants of a successful residency application. So if anything, I would probably really just remember this and, and mark this down. Your step one score, as I mentioned, is very important. Research experience. Um, start doing research now. Uh, you heard that from Dara in the previous talk. Start getting some research experience as, an, as a graduate or an undergraduate here in medical school and continue it through your intern year, your SHO training. The uh, people really look at this in the States. Uh, it's very important uh, to have uh, some type of uh, at least abstract on your CV. Uh, it's not really enough to say, you know, I did some collation of data, you know, whatever, uh, during my intern year, but not have an abstract to show for it. You must complete that with an abstract. That's very important on your CV. Work experience or clinical rotations. Um, I would advise you if you're serious about going to residency in the US or fellowship for that matter, uh, you should try and do a clinical rotation in the institution you want to go to. And the reason for that is not so much for your educational uh, needs, it's more to do with get people there getting to know you. Okay, so you want to meet as many people as possible. You know, hey, I'm Joe Bloggs from uh, RCSI in Ireland and, and go and work with all those people. You know, if you're in radiology, you rotate around these different places. If you're in surgery, uh, you work with all the faculty in that particular surgical specialty. Letters of reference are important. If you can have a letter of reference from someone that you did a clinical rotation with in the US, that's actually very important. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, the different, I'm sure this applies to every country, but particularly in the US, they may see an overseas application, they'll see these fantastic letters of reference, but they don't really know who these people are. You know, they, it doesn't register with them. Uh, if you can get a, a letter of reference from someone in the institution that you're applying to, someone that you've worked with, that is actually very important. And then finally, uh, the interview pro process is obviously crucial as well. Research experience, as I mentioned, get involved in research early in medical school. Uh, make sure that you present your findings and publish abstracts if you can. Try to be a co-author on papers or preferably a first author. And then, as I mentioned, try to do a summer elective uh, during medical school if you can. Or the other option is to do research electives. Summer uh, rotations, clinical rotations, tend to be a little bit more rigorous to get into because you're competing with other US medical students. But uh, you can do research electives. And on your research elective, you can um, uh, rotate in the hospital. We had a, uh, I had a, a, a student from Canada. I don't know if he's here today, but uh, who, was, uh, who rotated with me and did a research summer program uh, for two to three years. He's just got a paper accepted as a result of that into one of the major journals. But he was able to get an idea about the clinical programs in Northwestern. And then finally, if you do want to take a couple of years out to make your application more competitive, you can do research associate positions, which tend to be one to two years longer. Uh, clinical rotations, I won't dwell on this. Uh, try to do them, the institution that, that you prefer to work in. This is important. And try to have faculty <coughs> in that institution provide your letters of reference if you can. And when you're there, meet the program director. Meet the program director of the residency meet the program director of the fellowship program that you're trying to get into. Interview is obviously key. Uh, the final list is generated after the interview. The way the interview process works is probably broadly similar to, the, to here. You're scored in the interview. You typically interview with about uh, seven or eight people. There's a meeting after the interview. All the candidates are ranked. And then there's a meeting after that, and the final short list is provided uh, for that institution. If you get an interview, you've been shortlisted based on your application, so your application is good. Uh, so the key then is to try and really uh, make an impact in the interview. Try to contact people before and after the interview. So ask for advice. You know, what should I do in the interview? What are the chances of me getting in here? You know, if I, it, when you're in the interview, try to reassure people that if you get matched at that institution, that you are going to put that institution in the top five or the top three of your list because remember you're creating a match list as well and that's very reassuring for an institution because then they will know that you're most likely to go there and follow up after the interview most people the convention of states would be to send you know thank you letters or, or follow up by email that's important because that will go into your application file so what are the take-home points over 50 percent of international graduates match that's good. So that you've got a one in two chance of matching for most programs. Some programs are higher, as I mentioned, family medicine, internal medicine, 
some are more competitive. Plastic surgery, the single budding plastic surgery has a bit more work to do. Try to get your highest score possible uh, if you can on step one. Research is important and consider research or clinical electives. All right, we can talk a little bit more in detail about the residencies later. I'm just going to finish quickly uh, on some of these other uh, programs. What about fellowships? Many people may not want to commit to going to uh, uh, the US from the word go. So you do your training in Ireland and you go over for a fellowship. This is what I did. This is what many other people did. Dara Munley did it. A lot of, uh, a lot of graduates around the world go for fellowship uh, training. And the fellowship training in the States is, is superb. You get very good subspecialty training in all disciplines, surgery, you know, robotic surgery, all of this. We've had applicants come through uh, who have done this. Many fellowship programs are administered uh, similarly to the residency via matching process called the SMS, which is a spe specialty matching service. Uh, in general, it is easier to get into a fellowship compared to a residency. Fellowship is more about your connectivity, your network. You know, do people know you? Are there people in Ireland uh, that know a particular program? Your board scores are not as relevant for fellowship, so that's, uh, that's probably good to know. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but this is a similar type of process showing that there's more and more people now using this online matching program for fellowships. So you need to look that up if you're interested in fellowships. Again, I won't dwell on this, but this is the list of all of these fellowship programs within the match, okay, the fellowship match. And you can see they're very diverse. Uh, for example, here in radiology, we have two programs, interventional radiology and neuroradiology. Surgery has some uh, very impressive programs which are very subspecialized. You have to look through that. Some are more competitive, some are not. They vary in length. Some surgical programs have a research year, some do not. Sometimes the research year is optional. So you have to keep that in mind and that will help you decide on what program you want to go to. I just picked a few of the more popular ones. Uh, cardiology, if we look at um, the programs that filled and the positions that filled, you can see that there were, as time has gone on, there have been uh, more unfilled positions and more programs on field over time, which means that these programs that traditionally were very competitive are actually not as competitive as they used to be. Uh, now, that being said, um, I will say that the job market uh, in the States uh, at the faculty level, private practice has tightened up a little bit in recent years, mainly due to uh, Medicare reimbursement cuts, which have affected reimbursement in general. So therefore, there are more US graduates doing fellowships. However, in general, uh, there's a better chance of getting into uh, fellowship programs. And similarly, I just took vascular surgery since this is also a popular area. And again, you can see it varies that there are many unfilled programs and many unfilled positions. So you can look at that at your leisure later on. Some key points about the fellowships. Talk to people who have been in a particular fellowship and talk to the program director. So use your RCSI network, use your network of, of other people. USMLE scores are, are not as relevant, however, don't hold me to that. I can say we don't really look as much at the USMLE scores other than you do have to have all three steps and you do have to have passed them. Uh, letters of recommendation are important. Referrals are important. So if you have someone who's referred from another institution or from here, that is very important. Uh, and in general, it's a little bit easier to get into fellowship compared to residency. Some caveats about fellowships. Many specialties, uh, unfortunately, do not provide a pathway to board eligibility or certification through the fellowship alone. So uh, that may be a problem. So if you decide to do cardiology fellowship in the States, you do your three years of cardiology or two years, depending on the program you go to, you will not be board eligible at the end of that. And uh, the reason for that is that many specialties require a um, uh, previous board eligibility or board certification in another residency. So for cardiology, you have to be board certified in internal medicine before you get board certified in cardiology. So check the rules uh, for each uh, specialty. Make sure that the institution you're applying to will provide you with the appropriate visa. Again, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that time permitting, but visas can be very important. Um, and uh, it's worthwhile asking about what type of visa uh, the institution provides. 
Most institutions will sponsor either a J-1 or, or an H-1B visa. Um, the default is the J-1 visa. Uh, the reason uh, it's the default is that it's easier. It's easier for the applicant. It's easier for the institution. It's cheaper. It's quicker, okay? It takes about two to four weeks to get a J-1. It's a very easy process. An H-1B, on the other hand, is longer process. It's more expensive. It used to be that the applicant would pay the expenses associated with the H-1 visa, the B visa application. Unfortunately, now it's a requirement for the institution to pay all of the fees. And while that may seem good, it's actually not because it's it's a it's a disincentive for the institution uh, to do that. And it can cost from three to five thousand uh, dollars for an H-1B application, mostly because of the attorney fees. However, an H-1B is more desirable. And the reason it's more desirable be, is because it is a pathway to a green card. The J-1 visa requires uh, this home residency um, requirement, which means that after your completion of training, you have to either return to your country of origin for two years or work in an underserved area. And an underserved area is actually uh, a very good option for people. Several people have done this. You can work in a VA hospital, for example, uh, in a major city, and that will uh, serve the J-1 uh, requirements. Medical licensure. This is another um, important point. If you apply for residency or fellowship for that matter, you have to get a medical license and you will be asked to fill in the application form for a medical license. This is, in my opinion, an incredibly daunting, tedious and time consuming, consuming thing to do. You have to pay certain attention uh, to aspects of the license application. Make sure there are no gaps in your training and that you have completed the minimum number of months required for medical school. If there are gaps, uh, so say you took a year out or you took a few months out, uh, you know, don't include things like your three-month uh, vacation in uh, Tahiti or something. You know? So um, you, need to, you need to account for all of your time for medical school. And if you don't, uh, your, your application will get flagged and it will get delayed. And I can tell you uh, I've had some direct experience of that. All the support material must be provided, which means that your certificates, which you get, need to be translated into English. Most of them are in Latin. Are they still in Latin? Okay, but the RCSI is very, very um, uh, knowledgeable about this and, and, and is very helpful. Uh, I, I think RCSI now has its own um, medical degree, is that right? So when I was there, you got your medical degree from the NUI. Oh, really? Okay, so that's a different office. and they. It, you know, I don't want to slam it as much, but they tend to be a little bit less helpful, you know, in getting this. So it's very important to, to, to look at this. Um, a permanent physician license is required to practice independently in the U.S., and the requirements vary by state. Most states require that you have two years of uh, training in a North American institution. Some states require three years. Okay, so Massachusetts is one of those. Some states are a little bit more stringent, such as California. Um, what that means is it, it doesn't have an impact from the point of view of residency, but for fellowship, for example, if you only have two years of training, you may not reach the requirements for uh, USMLE certification, or uh, rather, um, a license, permanent licensure certification. And all of these basic requirements have to be fulfilled, so you have to have had all uh, three steps of the USMLE passed. And then finally, I'll just finish up on board eligibility and certification. Um, at the end of your training, you are going to be looking to become board eligible so that you can become board certified. Um, there are two different things. Board eligible is when you've completed the various requirements of training. Board certification is when you've completed the actual exam. Um, so most specialties will require at least completion of a 36-month residency, for example, in internal medicine. Um, therefore, you can see that fellowship training alone may not be sufficient. Now, it depends on the specialty. Radiology, for example, provides a pathway for you to become board certified from the fellowship point onwards. So radiology require four years of contiguous uh, working experience in an academic institution in the US. So you can get board eligibility that way. And how does this impact your job chances? Well, uh, most institutions will require at least board eligibility. So you may not have, be eligible to, uh, to uh, work in the faculty of a hospital. Certainly most private practices require board certification uh, for you to work there. And that's required for billing, all of these things that are all tied into it. Now, it's not as, as strict as 
as it may sound. There are some ways around that. So depending on the institution, the chairman of a department can actually bypass the system and sign off on your application. So we've had people who've come in and were not board eligible, but the chairman signed off on their privileges for the hospital, allowed them to work independently with the expectation that they would become board eligible o over time. And uh, I just put this in for cardiology, since this is one of the more um, uh, uh, competitive areas. You require a 36-month internal medicine residency and generally a 36-month cardiology fellowship to get board certified in cardiology. And these are all, this material is all available uh, through the various websites that I'll provide. So in summary, just to finish up, uh, if you plan to remain in the U.S. long term, residency is probably the best option. So if you're in the fortunate position that you've decided you want to work in the States, go do your residency. Um, complete your training here in Ireland, you can complete your internship and then apply uh, prior to that uh, for the various residency programs in the U.S. Otherwise, fellowship training may be suitable for shorter term training. Many of us have done fellowship training in the U.S. I have many of the other people working back here have done fellowship training and uh, the training uh, can be really superb but bear in mind that it may have an impact on your ability to work long term in the state so it depends on, on the various specialties. Pay attention to the USMLE scores, get your research experience, do your research now, consider research or clinical electives and when you do apply either ask from other people or the institution itself what visa types are sponsored. A lot of the time the people you interview have no clue about the visas. They don't even know what the visas are called. So it may be useful just to ask other people who are in the programs, what is the policy of that institution? They may not have a policy, in which case you should ask for an H-1B visa if you can. And these are the various resources uh, that may be helpful to you, which I believe is uh, you have access to. So thank you very much for your attention.